Hi, my name is Jackie Hart, and we are at the November 2022 uh, UX Generalist Alliance meeting. We have uh, Elmer Tucker and Veronica Rodriguez here with us from Glime Publication, presenting their talk, Bootstrapping a UX Culture from Zero to Slightly More Than Zero in Six Months. Without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing, and you guys are welcome to take over. Okay, I'm going to share the screen. Is that cool, Elmer? That's awesome. Great. <laughs> mm. Oh, advanced. I let Veronica okay. know my computer was having some sort of brand seizure. So let uh, me know if you guys can see a presentation. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Ready to get started? Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Hi, everybody. Um, so, whoa, whoa, here we are. Uh, introduction. Uh, who are we? Um, as we already mentioned, I'm Elmer Tucker, I'm the software development uh, and video department manager at Glenn Publications. We're a local to Gainesville um, uh, e-learning company that focuses on accounting and aviation materials. We kind of do, we help people get their certifications. And so because we have a learner focus, a lot of the kind of work we've been doing, especially with UX, is focusing on making those outcomes easier to to consume for people, um, make the the challenge of a 130 plus hour uh, pre exam situation palatable, that kind of stuff. Um, and I'm joined by Veronica Rodriguez. Hello, Veronica. Hi. Yeah. So I put my title as user experience researcher, but the truth, uh, at least in the context of my company, is probably more like user experience generalist. Um, uh, we're going to go through more of this presentation, but I feel like I'm going to drop this nugget to kind of like add some mystery, but I actually only got this title about two months ago. So um, are we ready to move on from there, Elmer? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You're telling them about the slightly more than zero that we managed. Yeah. <laughs> That's excellent. Um, yeah. So some context, just a general disclaimer. Uh, we were able to accomplish a great deal in six months. Um, we still have a lot we're working on. Um, a lot of it's very new for us. Um, one of our biggest barriers was just lack of knowledge. Uh, and, and so we had, we had the motivation, we had the desire to do it, um, but this became a lot of, all right, we're at A, we're trying to get to B, how do we get there, right? And so we're gonna talk about some of that process as well. Um, one of the things that we had on our side um, is that I've been uh, at the company for 15 years. So I've moved through a variety of different roles. As I mentioned, I'm a professional generalist. So I've been able to kind of work with our content teams or working with our marketing teams, et cetera. Um, and so I'm able to meet directly with stakeholders, very high level stakeholders. And it put me in a position to say things like, you know, I think UX might be helpful here. Or, but what do our users think? Ponder, you know, for a little bit. Um, so that, that definitely sped this up. Um, but I would say that in general, the principles are the same, right? Uh, Veronica, do you want to add anything? Um, I think the only thing I would add is um, we once we pretty much understood our uh, lack of knowledge was what we were facing, I think we pretty quickly leaned into like NNG, which is kind of why you saw us like you saw Elmer on some days of the uh, GNV startup courses. And then you saw, I think, I think I had the majority of the classes. And then uh, you saw one of our coworkers who isn't here for one of the other ones. So we were trying to cover as much ground as we could <laughs> with what was out there. Um, and we definitely went to like, okay, like where do, what isn't messing around? And we were like, let's just do NNG. It's not messing around. They literally made some of these like heuristic laws. So, and with that, I think uh, anything else, Omar? No, that's actually a great segue. Um, yeah. So speaking of NNG, um, well, we'll get to this, but briefly, no, you're good, go ahead. Um, okay. Well, some of the foundational research we did um, and that we're going to talk about today is about the, uh, the stages of UX maturity. It's a, a series of articles on NNG's website. Um, we're going to talk, we're going to zoom in to, uh, to that. There'll be a link involved. So if you want to take a look at it afterwards, it's definitely something that we are just hitting very, very high level for a lot of this. There's a lot of material there. Um, but yeah, so I thought we'd start by uh, deconstructing, bootstrapping a UX culture. What do I mean by bootstrapping? Um, so the term bootstrapping refers to re uh, relying entirely on your efforts and resources. In business, this means that you're not getting outside investment. Uh, in software, you're creating a little program that kind of is a bootloader and moves into the next piece. It's fundamentally about getting started with your own individual silo of material and trying to get 
self-propagating, right? Um, so the picture on the right, do not be alarmed. Um, this is a gentleman pulling himself out of a swamp uh, and his horse uh, by his own hair, right? The original quote for bootstrapping was that it, it was an impossible task, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Um, and the culture has kind of pivoted to say like, yeah, why don't we do that? Which should give you an idea of what, what you're gonna expect going into this kind of process. It's a little bit of impossibility uh, carried as far as you can take it. So, uh, Bronk, would you mind moving forward? Mm -hmm. Excellent. So this is the uh, article UX maturity model. For our talk here, we're going to focus on the first four stages. Um, five and six are are beyond anything that I feel comfortable talking about because I think we're like at four. Um, six is like a utopia, a user driven utopia. And in, in the articles, they talk about how that's challenging not, uh, to maintain, um, and that that so you can kind of explore that. I would say one of the big foundational pieces here is find the phase that's appropriate for where you are at or where you want to be and, and try to target that. So we're gonna step through initially the first four. Uh, we stopped it, we're at four right now. We intend on, on continuing, of course. Um, but Veronica, if you would not mind. Stage one, uh, your UX culture is absent. Um, so symptoms, complete ignorance about UX, uh, apathy, half-hearted intentions. This is frequently not very common in technology companies because UX is pretty pretty adjacent. A lot of the, uh, companies are aware of this, but you'll see it in other spaces. Um, you'll find that a lot of times at this stage, knowing that this is a thing that you should be doing is the primary hurdle, right? Um, and so the article talks about to progress from this stage, you should concentrate on building UX awareness. Um, so UX awareness at this level might be explain that the concept exists, that you can go out to customers, that you can apply research and design practices that are centered on driving outcomes for them instead of just what your uh, stakeholders are interested in or instead of you know what, what feels good or whatever, or whatever your current darts at a dartboard situation is. Um, but one of the other bits here <clears throat> is that even if people are aware of UX, it's such um, a broad set of topics, they may not know where to start. So you can be a resource here. Like I mentioned, I'd whisper in the ear of our higher ups and say, I think UX could be a part of a solve here or you know, um, finding roles that are adjacent to user experience, um, front-end development, right? Um, when you talk to front-end uh, engineers, they are going to want to leverage these same principles. They're going to want to create something that is vetted uh, that way. Uh, graphic designers, um, uh, data analysts, or information scientists, also very, very easy discussion about but how do people think. Uh, psych majors, definitely there if you've got some. Um, product managers, <clears throat> marketers, like basically anyone who might potentially see the value in developing these skills um you kind of you can kind of focus on communicating with them on the potential values um <clears throat> so so one of the steps there is finding allies uh, you're not always going to be able to tell someone that ux is the answer and that's okay that's kind of like an implicit bias if you try to solve every problem with ux right every not every problem is a nail um so the ux hammer is, doesn't always need to come out but but when it does apply uh, then you're going to want to bring it out quickly and effectively. Uh, <laughs> hammer motion. Uh, Veronica, anything you want to add on that for this step? No, I think uh, what I was going to kind of illustrate for them is like at least where what stage one almost looked like for me, like uh, which was basically like I wasn't in UX, UX, UX yet. And it was marketing, what it looked like while I was in graphic design was marketing a lot of the same features in the same way every time. Like we had nothing new to say because there were really no iterations right being done on the existing designs yeah and, and i think one of the um, one of the elements about that right is when you're talking to people speaking about the benefits of ux in a language they understand um so for instance if you're talking to someone who is interested in driving signups uh you know like reach for, for your business there's you're going to want to bring in research you're going to want to bring in elements to talk about how this can increase your reach. When I'm talking to front end designer or front end engineers about the value of UX, one of the first go to's I have is if you build it right the first time, you won't have to build it again, um, which motivates a lot of people. Uh, they, they're like, oh, we can spend four hours talking about it now, and that's 20 hours of, of engineering work that I'm not going to have to redo. Um, so definitely understand 
what they're trying to get out of it or what the benefit is to them. Um, and when you're spreading like the kind of cultural awareness, and this is actually also uh, through the other phases as well, the other stages as well. It's just that at stage one, that's literally the only thing you can do because your, your fundamental concern is no one knows what you're talking about and they have no real reason to listen. So as you address that problem, now you move into stage two, which is a limited uh, culture, right? UX work is not done routinely. This is what I found to be one of the most common failure points. Certain projects, they, they you can reach in the closet, dust off your UX tools, and say, "All right, we're gonna we're gonna do this one, you know, real good." Um, but then three or four other projects will pass by. <sighs> advocate for UX, you might say, "We probably should have looked at that, or we could have added value here and here and here." Um, but at a stage two uh, organization, it's just going to be pretty inconsistent. Uh, and then one of the other elements is that it's not consistently well executed or incorporated into strategy and planning. This is another one that you see a lot where, where a team will say, well, we don't really have time for UX because we need to we need to get this feature out, right? And like I said, at Glime, we actually have been very, very lucky because we've had a strong culture focus on the candidates. Like we call our customers candidates because they're going to sit for certification exams. I apologize for the jargon. Um, <clears throat> but we, we've had like, you know, driving force on this. Um, a couple of years ago, we won some support uh, awards simply because we believe that helping people on this path is is like how we add value, right? There's the material to study, and if we can stop them from falling off that path or make it approachable, then we're really helping them out. Um, so the the idea of how exactly are we going to put this into a project was not really as much of a, I'm sorry, the idea of we should put this into a project wasn't really the problem. The question was, how do we start applying that, right? And at this stage, one of the ways you move through it is by uh, creating small wins, right? You're going to, you're not just gonna say, hey, you could use UX for that. You're gonna say, here's how we applied UX to solve this customer problem. We, if you're, if you're rebuilding a shopping cart design and you're trying to figure out how, what's causing your bounce rate, right? Um, understanding, why users leave, paying attention to, um, to where they're at in their process and their user journey. This kind of information can help shape the, the approach that you use to solve it. Um, and if you can point to, oh, we were able to double our, um, our conversion rates, or we were, able, we were able to reduce our bounce rate by 35% on a given page, that's the kind of thing that generally gets other people to go, all right, tell me more. How, how are you going to help my weird project? All uh, right. And so this is kind of interesting because in the beginning part, we talked about um, promoting yourself and how are you going to push like the value that you add, especially when it's a new skill set. This is pretty pivotal in building that UX culture because you, by definition, cannot have all the answers. It's not going to function in that way. But what you're building is the spirit of collaboration that says together we can get there. Right. Um, and so, again, you're still talking about allies. You're still talking about training. Um, at this level, you start um, wanting to improve processes as well, um, <clears throat> because uh, like we said, in this stage, UX work is not done routinely. So in order to move forward, you need to create systems and processes that can be picked up or at least explained to your coworkers. Um, if you're going to work with an engineer, uh, you need to understand what is the language an engineer is going to speak. Uh, not that they're going to develop in, but what are they expecting from me? And, and what can I give them to make this process smoother? Um, I'll talk about this a little bit more later, but probably one of the big guiding principles that we try to incorporate at Glime is when you're building up um, the, you know, the UX culture, you're, you have internal users, right? Like this isn't just your customers. This is people who are, these are people who are interfacing with you to get their jobs done. And if you can approach them with that same empathy of, and, and sense of curiosity of how can I make this a better process? It's going to make the adoption much, much smoother because it's not, a, it's not a cram down where you're saying, Hey, do this. UX knows what's going on. It's how does UX fit into the puzzle or the process right now? How can we add value? <clears throat> so focusing on and bringing those processes uh, can be really, really helpful as well because they'll continue to be pain points. And if you iterate through them and resolve them, you can kind of um, just make the everyday work a little bit better. Uh, Veronica, do you want to share any examples from, from your experience with that? Yeah, I think a perfect example is like um, 
so what where it would start for user experience is one i was just viewed as a graphic designer who would kind of have a specialization with more like guis basically it's like okay so she understands screens right and i wouldn't be involved in like the higher level conversations elmer usually would be involved um but even then it may just kind of whittle itself down to like a single feature. I was not necessarily in those high level conversation of is this even a feature we should be doing, right? Like this was that was just not part of our process yet. Um and I think the really key difference here is basically um UX was siloed. Like it would be like, okay, she did her thing. It's it's done. It's delivered. And if a dev a de if, if a developer had a question, like that would have to have to go through multiple channels before it got to me. So I feel like that is such a good example of level two, where it's like you're you're doing work, you're getting small wins, but you're noticing those small um, bumps in the process where you're like, well, why can't a developer talk to me? And it's like, well, you don't know what they're going to say. And it's like, that's OK. Like we can figure we have to like I have to learn their language. They have to learn mine. Right. Yeah, no, that's that's exactly right, Veronica. And and again, one of the things you that we find at Sage Two is um, that UX is thought about making it look good, right? It mentions it here under uh, appreciation and support, and that's where a lot of these questions originate, right? Which is, oh, this interface looks off. What can we do about that, right? Um, and as we got a little further in our journey in, into integrating UX at like a like a strategic level, the questions kind of change, right? Like you're not handed a button that says like make this button look good, and you're not even handed a page that says make this page look good and has a button on it. You're given more open-ended questions like we want to we want users to feel this way and accomplish these tasks. Go forth, right? Like go, go do something with that. Ideate, discuss with the, the front end engineers on how we can tackle those problems. Um, as we got into stage three, emergent, I, and I could feel the transition here for us because we started getting requests at that level that weren't just like individual. Here's a feature, and we're doing it. How do you implement it? But really, the conversation shifts tonally into we have these objectives. How do we want to accomplish it? Right. Um, one of the biggest symptoms of, of the stage three is that there's no widespread systematic UX process in place. And so different teams, they might be familiar with the term UX. They might be aware of the value that it brings to the company, and they may actually have a few principles that they themselves are applying. But you kind of need to bring everyone on the same page, uh, especially again, it depends on your organization. For us, we have multiple uh, engineering teams uh, focus on different types of products or different types of features. And so it really became kind of an obvious thing for us that we want a consistent set of, of tools and language. When you build a design system, you're not building a design system for one feature, one project, you're building the design system for the, the business, or, you know, and you're trying to be uh, holistic and, uh, and think at a high level about how you're going to bring that together. So creating those kind of spaces where multiple teams have a similar understanding, a similar tool set, and understand how to get the most out of the process, that's really when you start kind of moving from stage three into stage four. Um, for us, one of the biggest um, bits here was improving processes and tools, right? You've gotten, you've gotten some wins. You ever, you've got people thinking about how you can apply it. You're being asked the right types of questions. But especially for us as a small group, you know, it was Veronica and I and one, one other person, and we were actually creating the design work for 15 or 16 engineers, right? And they're not all front end, but like there's a lot of elements in there that kind of interplay. And so we had to get pretty good pretty quick about responding quickly, creating a prototype, getting feedback. Um, the amount of time we had to um, play around in a given tool was pretty limited. So for this, at this stage, one of our goals was improving these processes. And there's a quote that I love, which is, um, improving daily work is as important as doing daily work. And so for us, fundamentally, if we weren't coming up with a better way to pass on design insights or to socialize our research um, <clears throat> or, or just kind of streamline the process and like find out when this person is asking this question, what are they really asking, right? Every time we were able to be successful with those, we made every future day that much easier, right? And that it's, it's like the principle of compound interest. By, by building these small wins up and up and up, within six months, it's a completely different 
universe, basically, for the work you're doing. Uh, that was the guiding principle we went under. And it's one of those things that's very hard to remember in the moment because you're only making these incremental changes. Oh, yeah, I'm going to host this design system here. Oh, yeah, we'll talk, we'll have a weekly meeting where we go over these items. They feel small, but in aggregate, they're what lets you move on, uh, move forward, right? Um, Veronica, did you have any? So at this stage, we also talked about training, uh, like kind of continued training. Did you want to talk about anything? Um, I think what I wanted to mention was this was actually probably around the time we started seriously documenting what the high level like UX process looks like. So it's like you give us a request. Here's how we walk through this request. Like here are the questions I'm going to ask you depending on what you hand me on this request. So I'm going to ask you the why are we doing this? I'm going to ask you what is it for? I'm going to ask you where is it going? You know, and in, in our case, we have a lot of product lines. So it might be a question of which product lines is, uh, is this going on, you know, and it's it's going to be a question of what is your intent behind this. Um, and furthermore, it's like once that happens, here's the next phase, which is I, you know, we kick it off, we meet with project management and developers, and we talk through what what user experience has come up with like is it viable is it technically sound because that happens all the time like user experience may have a very solid idea but at the end of the day um, we still have our technical limitations to consider and so it's a conversation of well how can I how can we cut this down without sacrificing quality and those were not really conversations we were having in, in step two at all um, and this was honestly side by side with training, right? Like I was also documenting like what I might have learned in training. This was, I think, around the time I took the, uh, I didn't take it with GNV. I took the usability test NNG course separately. And this was the, probably around the time I first started documenting usability testing and saying, if we do nothing else, this research, nothing if we don't touch another form of research it has to be this um and it was very new uh for us to consider uh letting someone who wasn't really marketing or i guess a um product oriented product like customer facing um out uh reach out to customers and say like hey tell me tell me what you're experiencing yeah i think that's actually an excellent point veronica because the the training you know we took a, a very targeted approach where the best answer would have been to hire a bevy of UX professionals, have them come like swarm in and like really kind of build it from the ground up. But again, that's not our situation, right? We're bootstrapping. We're going in and saying, I have one person, she can read 15 blog articles, and then we have to execute on this. What, what are the articles? What are the things we focus on, right? Usability testing was one of the ones where we said, we, we have to get on this now. Um, and simply again, because the for us, we always had visual design. We, we had some interaction design, but the research was a relative weak point, right? Um, and it's not that the research wasn't being done, it's just that it wasn't being socialized or communicated. You could find someone who was an expert on this exact thing, but were they involved in the process to the extent that they, they could have been, right? So a big part of that for us was understanding our teams, um, recognizing the silos of information, like Veronica said, and kind of bringing those together um, through some collaboration. Um, the, the other thing I'll mention on that step, no, you're good. The other thing I'll, I'll mention on that step is um, at this point, like you want to start measuring things, which, you know, when people talk about, you know, user data, everyone is super keen to measure user data. Um, but then you, you actually should be applying a lot of these same tools, a lot of these same techniques to your own incorporation of UX. Like, what are the metrics you should be looking at? How like how long did it like how well were you able to communicate this to a stakeholder? Like you know, were the, did everyone agree on the same principles? Uh, what was the time to incubate an idea, move it through, and execute on it? Right. And there's a lot of these. I'm not going to like go into what they are because they're going to be unique to your space. But applying that same data driven and experimental approach to your growth is is pretty important. I I found in looking at this and trying to piece this all together that. We use, we as UX um, professionals, use the same set of tools over and over and over, but the context changes, right? When you look at iterative improvement, like the principles and the mental framework of, we'll do a small change, we'll measure the results, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll ideate, we'll prototype. Those are all 
those can be applied to adopting UX. Those can be applied to socializing your research. Those can be applied to cr uh, creating better, um, you know, user analytics and actual like hands-on testing. It's all the same improvement mindset. So I, I found that, you know, having measurements, having an ability to sit back and look and, and really critically with yourself and your team members and say, what worked and what didn't is vital. It's vital at every stage, but uh, stage three is really where you start getting enough team members to actually make it like a functional exercise and not just like a rhetorical question. Um, so yeah, uh, Veronica, if you wouldn't mind stage four. Mm -hmm. Excellent, so structured. Um, and so, I mean, I may have, I may have stretched the truth like a very little bit. I would say that we're probably at a stage 3.75, maybe. Uh, <laughs> as I look at this, there's still a lot in here that is aspirational for us. Um, Organization-wide understanding of UX. Okay, I feel like we can get strong partial credit on that, right? But it's, you know, organization-wide is a lot. So it gives us this kind of focus on what else do we still need to execute on to really keep moving forward. Um, but like this, uh, one of the symptoms here, um, success metrics that have little to do with UX. This is one of the ones that I, I kind of mentioned in the previous you should have your own metrics for understanding this. And then we're gonna be mapping those to customer satisfaction. We're going to be mapping those for, if we said that we wanted to, to improve a feature, are we actually looking at what feature improvement looks like for the user? Is the time to execute this task lower? Are they getting just as much information out of it? Right, um, like what's their retention? What's their bounce rate on, on this? Um, we have a, a wonderful, absolutely wonderful part of our software that is a diagnostic quiz. Um, and you can watch the user, um, like you can watch users' attitudes of a change over their studies. Um, we start out with a very high adoption and people are like, oh yeah, cool. Uh, and then you kind of watch as they get closer and closer to the end of their, uh, the end of their studies when their exam date is looming. Um, it's one of the things that people are less interested in pursuing. It's still just as valuable to them, but that's where they think that they can kind of cut a little bit of time out. And so one of the metrics we'd be looking at is um, as we work on that feature, are we are we dropping users? Are like are we changing the rate by which we drop users? Some of that's going to be unavoidable, but is it within the tolerance, right? And that may not have entered the equation at all in the first three stages. But now you're starting to incorporate uh, again to move out of here. You're starting to incorporate success metrics that do have to uh, involve UX. Um, so on this one, um, <clears throat> like I said, this is kind of where we're at now. Um, some of the challenges you're facing um, include development processes that don't include discovery um, uh, or iterative design. And this is the same kind of thing where it should be baked into your exploration of a project or a feature that there is a research phase. If you don't have a research phase, that's kind of a signal that you're, you're not really where you, you want to be here. And again, I'm not saying you want to be here, we wanted to be here. I recommend it, it's a great stage. Um, if you read about it a little bit more in depth on NMG, one of the things they talk about is a lot of organizations stop here because this is where you're getting value. Like this is where you have a functional UX department uh, and, and uh, understanding within the organization. Um, our goal is to continue moving forward. Um, we're, like I said, we're a user driven company. And so we really wanna be able to focus on on growing that, um, but but there's no shame in, in getting to here and having a, um, uh, it says variably effective, which to me is like a nightmare term. Um, if someone told me that I was being variably effective, I would cringe immediately. Um, but but I, <laughs> I think the intention here right, is that, that you are, you're effective to greater or lesser degrees. Um, so the other, the other thing I wanted to mention on this is the, like the progress here is one of the ones that's very hard to bootstrap. Um, so and it's not a, a reason to stop, but you're, you're focusing on integrating UX into business strategy. At this point, if you don't have access or if you're not at the table when people are talking about business strategy or, or like functional initiatives, you're gonna have a really hard time getting through here. Now, fundamentally, if you're at this stage, you should have that access because your organization should be at the point where it's seeing widespread benefit from adopting these, these tools and, and processes. But again, this is why we, I kind of wanted to stop here at bootstrapping because this gets into now the rest of your UX life. Um, it's, not, it's not about like jumpstarting. So uh, Veronica, did you want to say anything about this? Oh, I actually, um, I actually am going to save this for the Q&A because I think we technically have like, I'm just watching the time. So I'm, I'll save it. 
I'll save it. <laughs> right. Uh, so our goal was level four. We already mentioned that. Um, set your own goals. Understand where you're at. The NNG article also talks about this, where they say, don't be discouraged because these things can take a lot of time to, to iterate through. Um, your experience going from two to three may, may be months and months and months. It may be, you know, you get buy in your small startup. Cool. You talk to all five people and you're good. Um, so, yeah. Um, so bootstrapping UX culture, very high level. <clears throat> what is UX culture? Uh, culture is the shared set of values, goals, and practices. Here are some that we try to target in our organization. I'm just going to hit some very big highlights. Um, curiosity, right? Like um, we, we want to have an experimental mindset. We want to be thinking about, um, there's not, not like a success or failure. It's just what can we learn next? Um, so again, I, you'll see this, you'll see a different set of these depending on where you're at. Um, for us, one of the other, um, again, goals is continuous improvement. We want to, we want to keep going and making these improvements like a single waterfall type of project, not really the best way to proceed. So, um, you're going to kind of, kind of come up with your own sets of these. There's no like set UX culture starter kit, you know, um, but try to understand how it fits into your, your work. Mm -hmm. What is the MVP, uh, MVP minimum viable product of a UX culture? Veronica, you are the MVP. I'm not trying to be cute here. You're not the most valuable player. Um, in a lot of ways, <laughs> you're the only player, right? That's what bootstrapping means is that you are bringing this, you are driving this cultural change. And so when we talk about the minimum viable product of, of pushing that out, it's a single motivated individual um, continuing to drive and kind of evangelize these, these principles. So we were also being cute. You're also the most valuable player. <laughs> so start small, um, embrace progress. Don't be discouraged. There's a lot that needs to be done um, in order to like really, really adopt this culture. Uh, stage one, your success metric might be, I spoke to Bob about UX. Amy had a question about UX and I linked her an article victory right and you have to see those as victories because when otherwise you're going to look at the entire timeline and it's just it's just it's too much it's too much to consume so work on individual goals create opportunities for momentum right like if if i gave um amy uh, an article i would follow up hey what do you think of that article i when i read it i found this and this and this what if we did that you know like ladder that into some other connection or at least get the read that they don't care about your ux uh dreams it'll save you some heartache as you go forward um <clears throat> next slide please really small <laughs> uh starting a project uh very ambitious um probably gonna probably gonna have some real learning um some real bumps in the road as you go uh feature might be too big just a single change, right? Your goal is to get something out there and then get feedback, iterative development. Uh, so don't, don't think that there's no worthless discussions there. You can increase the user experience or improve the user experience. You should. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna fly through this pretty quick. SMART goals, um, if you haven't heard of them, SMART is a framework for setting goals. Um, your goal in a, a not SMART, which I'm sure is a dangerous way to, to talk about that. Uh, your not SMART goal might be, I want to improve the UX culture, dot, dot, dot. Um, that's not super actionable because it's not measurable. Um, it's not achievable in like a concrete way. Like if you put that on your to-do list in the morning, it would stay there for months while you, while you did that, right? So SMART goals are about creating time-based, relevant chunks of goals that you can either succeed on or fail on and get, get feedback on. You're going to notice, again, that trend of do a thing, measure it, learn, comes up all the time. Uh, speaking of design thinking, uh, Veronica, do you want to talk about design thinking? Sure. So design thinking is basically, um, I would call it one of the basic tenets of UX, UI, right? Um, so it's something you're going to use over and over again, no matter how mature or immature your um, user experience uh, part of your company is. So first things first, right? You want to empathize and you could almost consider your company like the project, right? So it's like, what are the attitudes in your organization towards UX? You want to be just as curious. Um, I think 
something that was helpful for me was basically understanding that user experience could not only just help our candidates, but help our coworkers. We were all facing similar pain points being siloed. Um, it was not that nobody wanted to talk to each other. It is that um, we just kind of saw these barriers to entry and never knocked on the door. <laughs> like we never tested to see if there would be any momentum there, right? Like we never sent that link. We never said hi. We just kind of always assumed like, well, I, they're busy. I'm bothering them. Um, and that just forever kept everyone head down, you know? Nothing, uh, anything to add, Elmer? Uh, talk, to, if you have a manager, talk to your manager. <laughs> Get, <laughs> um, because that that's the kind of thing that comes up a lot, right? Is is people feel like organizational change is too big or too too hard. But like when you find out that a lot of people are aligned on it, it becomes a much more kind of solvable problem. So empathy and curiosity are like the number one tools here. It's where we start. And then afterwards, you're, you're going to define. So you're going to try and summarize uh, what you believe the problem is. And um, I think this really just comes down to, honestly, you want to define it in a way similar to the SMART goal, right? So you don't want to go so big and say like, well, our problem is all the all our um, teams are siloed because you you can't you cannot go and talk to every single team member that you may ever work with, but you can scale that down and say, I think I'm going to go with uh, I'm going to work on this project a little bit differently. I'm going to work on this ticket differently, and I'm going to ask to talk to the developer, or I'm going to ask to meet with the project manager instead of just you know using chat or assuming. Um, that it's been handed off just fine and letting it go. It's it's taking a little bit um, of ownership of your work, even if that might be awkward at first, right? Especially um, if the boundaries have been so clearly defined for so long. Yeah, I would, I would mention, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, I was actually going to toss it to you. <laughs> yeah, um, so I'm just going to say a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. This is just a way to kind of diagram and understand what you're working with. Uh, again, th this stage, we're trying to define and kind of clearly talk about um, what, we're, what we're trying to solve, what we're trying to address. Uh, elevator pitch. I encourage anyone who is trying to communicate at an organizational level to have a like three sentence version of what you're doing, because you never know when you're going to bump into your CEO and they say something like, so I've heard about this UX dot, 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 right? And if your response is like, yep, uh, that's a missed opportunity, right? There's, there's some stuff where you, you really wanna be able to explain what we're doing, why it's valuable. You wanna do that effectively because uh, I mean, I'm, this is this is user experience principle, right? Um, don't waste people's time. So if there's a way for us to address it, uh, if for you to have that in your pocket, please do. It's going to be very, very helpful. And that's an elevator pitch, just a quick thing. <laughs> so, and then you, uh, you go ahead and ideate. So what are some of the potential solutions to your problems, right? And um, I think you, uh, Elmer and I went back and forth on, it, on this because we understood it was a user experience presentation. But it is really important to go like, maybe your issue isn't user experience oriented, right? There's like some weird alternate universe where Elmer said, we don't need UX, we need data analytics. And that may have solved a totally different set of problems, you know, in our, in our company. Like, it doesn't presume that it's right or wrong. It's just different. Um, and it kind of it's it's kind of weird, but you still want to let that research guide you to help reach your conclusion. Anything to add, Elmer, before I move on? Oh, nailed it. Okay. Love your picture choice. Yeah, thank you. And then um, you create a prototype, right? Whatever, whatever that means, and uh, you re revisit the idea of starting small. So I think uh, something that I envisioned with a prototype was like changing my workflow. That was my prototype. I was like, okay. I'm going to try handing this off this way instead. I'm going to add labels that tell me who this is at, what priority this is at, um, and what type of work this is at. And we're going to see if this makes it easier to search, um, easier for the person to know that it's at them, and easier to keep track of. And that is a really small change, really easy to get feedback, because all it takes is maybe a week or 
like two days of that person you pass it to you going well I don't know where this is at like what does this label mean I don't understand like and so it you know and it could be from anyone it could be upper management coworkers, and you just have to be really really open to changing it because I will I will say maybe the hardest part is you do have to be prepared for receiving feedback at unexpected times <laughs> um and and test and it's I pretty much already talked about it but yeah you actually do the thing you get that feedback um and you hold that retrospective. Oftentimes, Elmer is basically my retrospective. He is my soundboard. Uh, part of that's because he's my manager, but part of that is also because he does um, buy into the philosophy of, of your everyday work. Improving on that is really important. Um, but all this comes down to like making sure you have an experimental mindset, using different tools uh, and, and frameworks. So your start, stop, continue, which is basically what I said. You start something, you pause. If it works, you can continue or you just stop, restart. Um, and then actually, honestly, Elmer, uh, you might want to go into this. I, I'm yeah. mad, yeah, sad, no, glad. <laughs> no, these are, yeah, so there's different frameworks, right? Um, and again, like when you get out there in software engineering, you might see agile or waterfall. These are methodologies. Um, when you talk about retrospectives or, you know, like what's your style? Ah, oh, we do scrum. We do you know, we were Kanban driven. Those are just different tools. Those are different um, processes for getting results. You're gonna have the same thing in retrospectives or in the work you do, right? Is, oh, we tried, yeah, so mad, sad, glad. After you do a project for a week, what made you mad? What made you sad? What made you glad about it, right? And and you can you incorporate multiple people's feedback and you kind of just compare notes. And, and again, if that doesn't work, you change your process. You prototype again, you test again, you do your retrospective again. Um, that's the experimental mindset. Um, the one thing I specifically want to say about this is uh, good outcomes don't mean good decisions and vice versa. Mm -hmm. This is a common thinking trap. Uh, someone says, well, it worked last time and it was great. Um, that doesn't mean that it was great. That means that you were lucky or fortunate, uh, right? And so I, when I try to explain this to people, um, a lot of times it's hard to disconnect those things. But if you walk through, if I did this exact, the exact same way, but that the outcome was different, would we be saying what a great idea that was? Because if the answer is that's what defines a great idea or, or a terrible idea is the outcome, you're not being objective, right? And so I really, this the retrospective is a great time for this to really just kind of challenge it, make sure the data you're getting is, is the best data possible. But I mean, honestly, throw it away like that in the previous slide for uh, testing. Um, if it doesn't work, throw it away. Um, you know, find, find what works for you. Uh, so yeah, in summary um, for us, right? So there's the three big TLDR, right? Uh, set goals, track your progress. And so these are some things we talked about. Envision your goals, kind of know where you're going. Be smart. Uh, without data, you're just another person with an opinion. Um, I made that slightly more uh, work friendly. There are different variations on it. Use what you want. Um, and be forgiving with your own expectations on time, right? This is one of the, the hardest things is you set this big goal and, and you feel like you're not accomplishing it. Just remember, smaller goals will get you there the same way. Uh, next item, <clears throat> be a relentless UX advocate. How do you know someone is interested in UX? Don't worry, they'll tell you. This is what it's like, is always being ready to talk about it, to uh, advocate for it. And people should generally have a pretty good idea that when they talk to Veronica, she's going to use this lens and she's gonna tell them how great UX is and why it's valuable. Uh, and this kind of builds up that, uh, that structure in your organization, you know, that makes you the, the owner of it. Um, and it helps you build out the, the culture. Start small, but start. This is like the most important message here is if you look at everything in front of you and decide that's a good reason not to bother, um, you will be exactly where you started. You will have denied yourself the opportunity for progress. Um, and this, is, this applies pretty much everywhere, individual skills, cultural growth, et cetera. Um, take one step at a time. All right, that's, that's the point of iterative. Um, I, I love this quote, and I'm not going to read you a quote that's already on the thing again. But what I will say is um, the most important step of a journey is not the first or the last, it's the next. And framing that in the everyday work that you do, that you're, you're going to put your foot down, you're going to grow, you're going to make a good choice towards your goals. That's pretty much the, the best way to kind of get the mental win that's needed to make this happen. 
so those are the three things. Um, set goals and track your progress, be a relentless advocate for UX and start small, but start. Um, so and then in conclusion, this is kind of what we did. We recruited key roles in the business to uh, advocate for UX. We identified resources and uh, we had we saw that a project was gonna be coming up where we'd really be able to flex some UX muscle. Um, so we did a, a few smaller projects to kind of get buy-in, build it up. Um, we reviewed the feedback uh, for the processes. Um, some of our project management staff and engineers were very vocal um, about uh, suggesting improvements, which uh, can feel very challenging in the moment, but is ultimately the best way to get everyone kind of moving forward. Um, and so, yeah, so we, we kept talking about UX and how we we're going to apply it, and we continue to iterate and refine. Uh, we still are. Again, obviously, there's still plenty to go, and this is our focus, is the mindset that says, all right, what are we going to do next? What are, what are we going to improve next? So that's what we did here at Glime. Veronica, do you want to add anything uh, to finalize? No, um, that was absolutely a great, a, a great uh, wrap up. And yeah, we definitely are still continuing down this path. <laughs> and I'm going to stop sharing uh, so that um, I think that leads into Jackie's Q&A, right? Yes, it does. I can go ahead and kick it off. I'm kind of curious about what your initial projects were as you were kind of going into this UX realm. Like, what did you pick out? So, so some of the first projects were not ones we would have picked out necessarily, but like in analyzing them, there was an opportunity. So we had a, a course that was um, it was separate from our main product offerings, but it was something that we wanted to bring out for kind of a different purpose. And so one of the things that we got to do with UX that, um, that helped a lot, really, um, it, it's, not, it's not my favorite project, so I'm not going to rep it as, as such. Um, but one of the things that really helped was saying, before we even got started, before we even started designing interface, which was the big task we had, was how is this different from this other project? How, how are the customers different? What are they expecting? Like, what makes this need to to be unique right uh and being able to kind of explore that was i think some of the first work we did into uh not the first work in the business but within our realm this is some of the first uh, user research we were really doing you know we sat down with product owners tell me about who this product is for we sat we talked to marketers how would you communicate uh, communicate this kind of thing what do you think the value proposition is um so that kind of thing for for that first project um can i actually add elmer i yeah, think the real first project i actually really ever had was a uh, truly a button it actually was trying to find the location for a select set of videos that we were adding to help our candidates with really specific questions right and that's like that is a great product set like there was um but it was um my first time like i think i didn't really and and this is I should I should say this is outside the span of the six months we're talking about, um, but I mentioned this just to show like really where sometimes you start like the weird places you start and Elmer was like yeah just sit ask them some questions you're gonna be sitting with some product owners and some upper managers and you know just let me I don't even think you were there Elmer and I or maybe you were you're like just let me know how it goes and I sat there for two hours I think I asked like two questions and they were arguing about pedagogy um and I was like what is pedagogy <laughs> um you know they were our, uh, educational uh principles that I really um hadn't heard of because I was marketing the product but I wasn't part of the team that was building the content right mm -hmm. and so that was like probably the first time I sat there and said oh this is going to be not just me learning about user experience, but also learning about my company. <laughs> yeah, I definitely, you know, I forgot about that project, you know, because I was like, oh, we'll start with the finish line. But absolutely, that just hearing the kind of challenges that they were having is a completely different world than, you know, um, oh, just, just do this button, right? I know there was one project that Veronica got that was, I, I was like an absolute tyrant about it because she came back. She's like, I think I have this idea. And I'm like, that idea is terrible. But <laughs> why are we even doing that? And she was like, I'm like, go go figure that out before before you design anything, figure out why we're doing this project. And it didn't, it was a whole bunch of like, you know, sleuthing on her part to be like, but really, why are we doing this? Why, you know, and and I think that that um she did, she picked it up super quickly by the way she's like an investigative uh, journalist now um it's excellent 
But um, yeah, so you never know. Um, for, so for our first projects, it was a mix of ones that we could pick and, and say, here's how we can add value. Um, mm -hmm. like, we'll go a little bit deeper. And also ones that were, we have this project. Now, what can we leverage to make it successful, right? Um, mm -hmm. Definitely, great answer. Does anyone else have any questions? I have a question actually, I haven't really formed it completely, um, but I'm thinking when you are trying to get buy-in um, from the CEO and the other C-level sort of executives, <laughs> is it a good idea to bring up what a competitor is doing? So say, would you say, hey, look, Becker did this UX case study and they're, you know, this is what happened to their product. Or should you stay away from that because people are like, we're not Becker, so we don't want to do what Becker does. Yeah, that makes sense. No, it, it absolutely makes sense. Um, and so, what I, I would give you the the broad answer first, which is know your audience. Like, like if it's at all possible to know that something is a trigger point or something like that, try to be aware of that going in. Um, one of the things that I I found challenging talking to um to any high level folks is a lot of times you're called in to have the answers but you actually just have a plate of questions right like and so that navigating that first is probably the, the biggest challenge oh hey you know and i i know who our competitors are but i i feel very comfortable saying you know would you say that this this competitor has a particularly good grasp on this like which of our competitors has the best user experience, which one's the most highly regarded, right? And which of their features is 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 valuable in that way? What's worth emulating? What's worth, you know, what's their weak point? Um, and so, I mean, it sounds cliche, but, you know, do your homework as much as you can. Um, in speaking to our CEO, I found, uh, I mean, I, I enjoy talking to her directly. Uh, she's very, very sharp. And so, and, and she's prone to go into kind of analysis questions. Um, so sh she's very willing to, to engage that, which I know and I love. So I got a lot of benefit from saying, well, this is this is the research that we did on this competitor. This is the research we did on this competitor. And here's how we think our features will be uh, framed up, right? Um, so at that point, the case studies that they did, and, and again, one of the other things I would say, sorry to like kind of side there, Amy, is understand where your competition aligns with you and doesn't align with you. Because if they have a different tack in the market or a different set of um, competitive advantage than you, that research may not be as applicable as you, you hope anyway. Like you said, you're not being them, but that doesn't mean you can't learn from, from that situation. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. I've got a question. What were some of your biggest roadblocks? What an interesting, what a great question, Jackie. Hard hitting uh, question. Veronica, are you thinking of one? Um, I can uh, tell you that, I can think of one, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, I'll, I'll start off. One of my biggest roadblocks um, in adopting this was that that I, I personally have limited design experience and limited like, you know, research experience. And so in trying to form a team that values these things, I can provide mentorship and guidance on what we want to do. But I, I had a very big challenge on how we would do it. So we would frequently end up with projects where it's like, okay, first I need you to research this. Then I need you to research how we would research this. You know, it's like, so you kind of create these spaces where I can visualize a path to success, but there's like three initial steps, right? Like we were using, um, we switched to Figma pretty early on in our processes. And I personally am not going in Figma and, and like building out components as an example. So when the process has come to how do we structure this and hand this to engineers, I, I had to assign work that was explain to me the differences between this and this, and why is this tool the right way to do it? And so that was a huge roadblock for me because I'm used to being able to kind of own the the training or own own some of the understanding but this was very much like hey go figure out someone should figure out what the right answer is and then do it can you start that you know and i'm again i'm very very fortunate that i had an incredibly talented team um a very curious and motivated team who would go yeah okay i'll, I'll go i'll go try to answer that question but for me personally it was challenging veronica yeah, I was actually going to say something kind of adjacent, which was uh, the training. Uh, that was a, a big roadblock because 
reading the articles, moving items forward and feeling like, cool, I'm learning. You know, it's, it's totally cool. I'm learning so many things. And then finally getting even just like an hour's worth of training. I was just like, oh, this is very different. And this is, um, we were right about a lot of things, but the ways to apply them weren't like as strict as I always expected. Um, I, I'm trying to think of like a real um, example. The usability testing one always stands out in my mind because I think I took that right before I did like an actual usability test. Mm -hmm. And the stress it took off me was like a 100%, right? Like um, it, like, you know, I was really thinking like, I'm going to have to go in there and I'm going to have to facilitate and I'm going to have to be like, I'm going to have to memorize the script perfectly. And if I'm one word off, like, that's it. Like I, I ruined the, um, the test and it's really not like that. Right. Like, that's just not the point. You're not um, supposed to be um, a like high level researcher. You're really just like a dude just trying to be as professional as you can in the room to see like what these users are going through while they use your product. Um, but I think like really another roadblock for me was application. Um, so something we faced was sometimes these, these projects that would come into our hands would be like, oh, wow, this, this needs a lot of, like, I don't want to say TLC, but it just needs, um, um, I can't, I can't find the words for it right now, but I, I maybe a more experienced hand. And that's when we actually started tapping in for, for Brie, like the third part of our trio, um, where it would be like, Hey, um, you literally made our branding. Can you help? <laughs> um, you know, and tapping her in, her in as the lead designer to, you know, not, not only start learning user experience, but continue applying her graphic design experience. Yeah, I think we got into a pretty good cadence um, uh, where we would identify user issues through um, feedback or usability testing. We, we, uh, Veronica would be able to like coherently explain them. Uh, Brie yeah. would, would bring visual design to the table to try to, as potential pitches to solve the problem. And, and I would try to align it with, you know, our product strategy and, and how we're approaching things to go like, yeah, no, that makes sense. And we have, um, we have a really cool, sorry, I'm a nerd, adaptive learning system. And so trying to communicate things that are happening magically through adaptive learning it's like okay yeah no that's valid <laughs> yeah the way you explain that is technically correct keep going right um, <laughs> so so yeah i think it was i think like you said there's identifying which resources we would need at a given time and trying to stay ahead of that was also a bit of a challenge because there's definitely a few times where i'd be like okay um and this spoke to something that amy mentioned earlier um writing surveys is not easy um, and, and if you write a bad survey, it doesn't tell you what you need to know. Um, and you only get so many shots at things like that because people don't like answering surveys endlessly, um, more is pity. So, so it's like, okay, today we're going to think about what we need to, to know. Tomorrow we're going to figure out how to write a survey. Day three, we're going to try to beat it up and figure out if this is like actually a functional survey or not. And once you've kind of done those processes, that becomes write a survey. It's, it's like mm -hmm. a step where you create the material, but until you've adopted those, predicting how long those things are going to take was, was pretty challenging. Mm, absolutely. At least for me. Definitely. I so, have a question. Uh, oh. Hi, everyone. It's my first time attending this meetup. I'm coming from the engineer side, engineering side of things. So my question is, you know, what are some of the important questions you want your engineers to ask you or someone who is representing engineers to ask you? Uh, super great question, Veronica. I'll start and then you can, uh, from your perspective. So I, uh, I manage the engineering team. And so I, like the first part of the conversation was, let's all get in a room. Let's talk about what we're going to need to adopt these kind of changes. So um, an early conversation was, what can our text, like out of our high level goals, what can our tech stack not accomplish without significant effort, right? And so understanding what, like what our constraints are on that level at the very, very beginning of the project, right? Include UX, include your engineers um, before you promise a feature. <laughs> every, every time, don't promise until you've talked to the right people. Um, but like one of the other questions that we, we asked a lot was, um, how do you want this information passed? This is so boring unless you're a like workflow person like me in which case it's like your your life's blood but 
okay, do you want a series of small tickets each outlining these individual features with like full design documentation on them? Are you okay with the design system that's externally referenced? Like, do you need a set of user stories that include this information uh, and, and like an attachment, right? Like, what is the team gonna function with? Um, and part of the thing there, speaking to engineers directly is, are you personally going to execute on this or are you going to hand this off to somebody else? Because that's a different type of conversation, right? Like, is this work going to be split up? In what ways do we have to make sure consistency is, is uh, maintained? So those are all different questions based off the team you're working with, again, at least in my experience. Yeah, so I don't think I've ever, um... No, that's not true. I was going to say, how often do engineers ask me questions? Like, actually, often. Sure. So, um, honestly, I think one of the main questions is, what is this and what does this mean? Those are like the top two expectations I have from engineers because that's my job, right? Like, I better know those features. Like, I came up with them and delivered them to you. So, um, frequently, it's a conversation of like, hey, what is this? What does this do? Have you thought of this scenario? Like, what's your intent here? Um, I think. I'm trying, um, I think like a great one was, uh, we were trying to come up with a way to express a score and it was just kind of like, okay, so how is this? Um, and I think we, we set on an image of a gauge, right? And it's just like, okay, so like, so one of the big implementation questions, right? Was like, um, so if they complete one thing, is it gonna show them that score or is it going to be out of a hole? So it only considers like that to be 5%. So even if you scored a hundred, you only, it reflects 5%. And I was like, oh, that is a great question that I didn't think about. Um, but it's it's what you would expect from engineers. Like it's a technical implementation question. So what I expect is basically the, what is it? What does it do? Where does it do it? When does it do it? Um, and so it's almost like basically the roles are reversed and I've just handed you a request. And now you're asking me, well, like, how do you want me to do this though? Yeah, and this is kind of a, a pivot off your question, but I would say there are some things that I, I wouldn't expect as questions, but would still want to make sure are understood, right? And so like when you're handing off a project, if the other person isn't asking why, like you should be clear and, and tell them why you're doing it. Um, because a lot of times engineers will, will, they'll understand the systems there and they'll understand the tools available. So they might tell you, well, we already actually have information like this. Is that what you want, <laughs> right? Oh, cool, you just executed this feature in like one tenth the time. That's great. Yep, that's what I wanted, right? And that that's the second part is, what are the barriers? What are the expected barriers to communication? Um, the number of times I had an engineer or, or a UX person say like, how should I give this to the person? And the answer was, did you ask them? Right, like, like just ask them. Right? There's no barrier there, you're imagining it, unless there is, in which case, you know, follow the rules, kids. But like fundamentally, yeah, what, what do you want? How do we approach this? Because once that barrier goes down a little bit, you create a space where instead of one side lobbying the, the, the golden UX truth over the wall and then engineering having to implement it, or, you know, like the, the other extreme where it's like, here's the suggestion. It's like, I don't like that suggestion. I'm going to do my own chart. I, like, I've decided that the scatter plot is much better and we're doing that now, right? <laughs> the Almost every point of friction here is actually an opportunity for conversation. So, so I, again, one of our, our values is collaboration. So this is one of the things that drives that. Your organization may be different. Um, if you're in a, a situation where your engineers are all contract work, that can be really challenging because you don't always have great access to them. Like you might need a more formal handoff or you might need something that's vetted by your product design team before it, it goes over there. So, but in general, uh, you know, driving the communication is, is a great way to clarify those things. Uh, Brittany, I think you had a question. Uh, thank you for the question. Excellent question. Thank you. Oh, yeah, that was a great question. Um, I was actually just curious about what other research uh, methods you've implemented since I know usability study was like a, the, the big one that you wanted to get in. And then I heard Elmer talking about like writing surveys and stuff. So have you started implementing those other research methods? Or are you still mainly focused right now on the usability studies? So the two we've managed to do so far are user interviews and usability tests. The third that um, has training wheels, I would say is actually surveys. 
Um, you know, all, all in our, we do have surveys, but we do pre existing surveys, and now we want to like really go through the lens of user experience for them. So sorry to interrupt. Mark. Yeah, no, that's totally fine. I don't want to give the impression we are surveyless. You well, know, it's survey, true. Though. How we do we have? have surveys, but yeah. now that we have like um, user experience people thinking about it, it's kind of just like, oh, when was the last time you vet, um, vetted this survey? Okay, yes. Um, let's let's give it another go, right? Like. Um, I know and that Veronica has been trying. She has been asking for us to do a diary survey. I uh, have a <laughs> every uh, well, this every is a great time to do a, a diary. It's like, yeah, I know, I, I know. <laughs> we should we should get on that. Um, I think it's great though. Please continue bothering me about it, Veronica. It, yep. Every um, every time, just like, what research do you think we should do here? And it's like, well, if you want to know how users really behave, we should at least do a diary study. Um, because I know the like eth uh, the what is it the ethnograph stud ethnographic study or like the one where your direct ob observation is the harder sell. So I was like, no, it's fine. Let's just set up a diary study. So to your point, we do have surveys right now. Um, we've pretty much already put in motion the edits like we want to make. Um, I think it's really just about prioritizing it at this point because um, the project we're in is kind of just like that'd be nice. So would everything else you've got on your plate. <laughs> there's a lot. Yeah, there, there's a lot. Um, yeah. Uh, one of the things I, uh, this is a, like a, a something we've been living by for a while, um, which is that you can have a, like a ton of data, but data only really has value insofar as it allows you to make better business decisions with it, right? Like if, if you're not making a better decision because you have access to this information, it was functionally useless. Um, and not that's not bad. Like for us, culturally, we're still trying to drive more research as like a fundamental thing. But it's something that I always think about when we, if we're going to send out an email and hit like 500 people and ask for information, like it really makes me go, what are we going to do? Like if they say that they despise this feature, like what what is our set of actions? If they say that they love yeah. this, what, what are our actions? Because if there's no difference there, like it wasn't a useful question. Um, now, I will say that's not that's not the same as exploration, right? Like I, I think there's a huge opportunity for exploration just in terms of saying, you know, and, and again, sitting down with people, the quantitative versus qualitative conversations, right, are, are kind of huge for this. So I, I think we do need to continue to grow that. Um, I dream of the day where we we make it a very regular, like, and I think we're pretty close to this for like quarterly, but a very regular, all right, it's Friday, we're going to, we're going to have a user interview, and we're going to bring in an engineer, and they're just going to observe so they can see this, or we're going to, it's Friday, we're going to have a user <laughs> interview, and we're going to bring in a marketing person, and they're going to observe, right, just to kind of continue to socialize that knowledge. I've said socialize knowledge, I think, 200 times in this presentation, so I apologize, just copy and paste that here. Um, but that's really the thing is that the, until the data becomes really understood and applied, it's it doesn't really serve you or your business. And I'm going to add real quick because I know we're over time, but basically um, something I will say is like knowing your audience sometimes is great because while our survey may need to be updated, the additional comment section does a lot of heavy lifting. Let me tell you, they have no problem going to those additional comments and saying, um, on this date, on this exact hour, I was doing this thing and it didn't do exactly what I thought it was going to do. So I think you should fix that. And I mean, I love it, yeah. but it kills me because I'm sitting there just like, when did you submit this? Like, how long were you holding on to that piece of feedback? Like, <laughs> yeah. I yeah. love it. Yep, more opportunities for feedback is good as long as you leverage it. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much, Elmer and Veronica. Your presentation was incredible and very insightful. Um, for everyone else, uh, we hold our meetings on the first Tuesday of every month. And if you sign up to join our meetup, you'll get little notifications sent to your email of when we have future meetings. Definitely check out our Slack channel, check out our YouTube channel, and yeah, and I hope you guys have a great November. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Great questions. Thank you. That was great.